roughly, how often should you replace a soft acrylic mould? Annually is what we would say is a minimum. Um, and I, I am hopeless. If somebody takes their ear mould out and it's yellow, I will automatically make them a new one. I'm everybody's budget nightmare, if I'm honest. But, you know, that's, that's what you get from me. Um, so how do we normally make choices? Well, normally we'd look at the scientific evidence available to us. So we'd go back and we'd sort of start looking at what do we really know about ear moulds and what do we know about the materials that we're using. And then we'd think about the patient because that's kind of what we all want to do, isn't it? That person sat in front of us. Now, I'm going to hold my hand up at this point. I've got two presentations, and I'm going to use patient, client, customer, and person interchangeably so that none of you get confused at any point because it, it will just slip out, so I may as well hold my hand up now and tell you that, to me, they're all interchangeable. So then we think about our experience and judgment. So quite often we think about, OK, so that worked for the last one that had that type of a hearing loss, or that worked last time I had somebody with an austerity problem. She really liked that. And then we think about the clinical circumstances. So are there any reasons we wouldn't use a particular material? Has somebody got an allergy problem? Has somebody got a problem with a particular malformation of their eardrum or anything like that? So that's how we'd normally make decisions. And the scientific evidence would come into that quite strongly. But actually, for ear moulds, there's very little scientific evidence. There's been very limited research into ear mould technology. Most of it was in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and it was done by Mike Nolan and um, the School for the Deaf in Manchester. So most of the stuff, if you Google it, will come up with those people. Um, and it was in the 80s when you have to admit that technology wasn't good. And we had hard and we had soft. We didn't have 30 different types of material. Research into the manufacturing techniques in the 1990s was undertaken and is available to you. But that really was about how do we produce better moulds rather than what does that really mean to the customer in front of you. So small research studies in later years, but less interest since Rick and Open Fitting took over the world. Rick and Open Fitting have really taken over the world. So you're talking in a global market about 55% being Rick and Open Fitting um, these days. So it's a huge difference to what we were a few years ago. So evidence and experience. Well, let's try and talk about some of that. Hard versus soft materials. Hard materials are not suitable for paediatrics. So these are some of the things I hear commonly. Softer the better for power products. Softer moulds are more comfortable. If someone's allergic to a mould, we should swap to a soft material. Soft is soft. So we can just use the T108B and we're done. Um, and hard with a soft tip is a great option for all. Well, you've already heard my opinion on hard with a soft tip. It's, it's not going to get any better. So I'd like to claim to be a myth buster today. I hope some of you have seen that particular programme. It's one of my favourites of a late night telly watching. Um, and hard materials not suitable for paediatrics. Well, maybe. Because what we tend to find is that if a patient's prone to bumps or falls, then hard materials might shatter if struck. Has anybody ever found a shattered hard material mould? Oh, Lynn has. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting because the, the interesting one I've seen is somebody who had it rolled over by a, a steamroller and it still didn't shatter. It was, just ha it was just flat, very flat. He brought it to me to show me. Um, but I think to shatter it, you've got to have that impact actually on the actual ear mould and in that particular location. And pretty much we've, we've tried it. And if you hit it with a hammer, you can shatter it. But it's, it's not common. Um, how materials are less forgiving in a rapidly growing ear? And that's true. So if you have got somebody who's changing shape, and if we're talking about adults, they could be losing weight due to particular medical problems. They could be gaining weight. They are prone to, um, to slit leaks. And cosmetically, hard materials are superior. Cosmetically, they're great. Hard materials are that, that real clear material. So they do keep the um, structure as well quite nicely. So in some ways, the cosmetics are really good. And you'll find teenagers 
quite like the hard materials because they can be very discreet in the near. So that kind of tweeny age where they're starting to kind of reject their hearing aids and mums maybe come into a private practice to look for some maybe different options and some solutions that maybe their audiology isn't offering, then that can be quite an interesting thing to think about. They are brilliant for maintenance. So hard materials are great for maintenance because they can be washed. So if you've got somebody who's got a problem with discharge or likes that ability to be able to clean their ear mould, then a hard material is fantastic for that. And of course, if you've also got somebody who has problems with the actual fitting, then drilling a hard material in practice with just your little Dremel drill is much more possible than some of the softer, more complex materials. Softer the better for power products is my next myth. And I'd like to say that that is a myth. Um, and the impression, what you guys do on the outside of an ear mold factory rather than what we do in-house, is much more important. The impression is key to the fit, not the material. If you send in a poor impression to the manufacturer, A, you'll amuse us because we'll laugh at you. Um, um, no, we won't. I promise we don't do that. And B, it won't fit. So if your impression looks dodgy, your ear mold's going to look dodgy. We can only work with what we've got. Excellent feedback managers in hearing aids. Nobody makes a bad hearing aid anymore. Well, no, no, nobody. Um, but excellent feedback managers effectively reduce a lot of the fit issues. So you find now that the whole research stuff that we were looking at was 70s and 80s, where feedback managers were in their infancy and were pretty much notch filters. These days, with really good feedback managers on product, that excessively tight fit that you might get for a very soft mould isn't necessarily um, any better than actually turning on the feedback manager in the product. And soft acrylic, soft acrylic is porous, so it absorbs any water, sweat, all of those things, and it shrinks in as little as 12 months. So we would say that if you go soft acrylic, because it's a power product that you fit in, you definitely need to make sure you're replacing it every 12 months to get a nice tight fit in. There is no evidence at all that soft gives a better fit. In general, all the studies indicate that ear mold fit and acoustic seal are not enhanced by the use of soft materials. Accuracy of the ear mold fitting is determined by the impression taken. The viscosity of the impression material is important. So now that we've introduced this idea of deep impression taking and we're talking about going into the bony canal, a lot of people are using a much less viscous material to make it more comfortable in the bony canal. It's absolutely fine when you're that deep. But if you're still in the cartilaginous portion of the canal and only just going into the second bend to get the direction, because of course every impression you do shows us the direction of the second bend, doesn't it? Everybody nods, doesn't it, Russell? Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you're only staying in the cartilaginous portion, a very um, flexible material doesn't push the walls out and it doesn't give us the full shape of the canal walls. So we would say that you need two impression materials, that you need an impression material for when you are going into the bony portion and you don't want any force onto the canal walls. And then you need an impression material for your standard products where you do want the cartilage to be forced outwards to uh, an extent to make sure the fit's good. And of course, the parameters of the moulding process have much better um, ability there. So you have much better ability with the moulding process these days. If you are using a, a lab that uses things like um, dipping, then of course that's going to cause you um, different sizes on your moulds because dipping into a hot wax is a slightly unscientific process. It's a little bit like putting on nail varnish and getting blobs for girls. Nail varnish for girls. Soft moulds are more comfortable. Myth. Generally, no evidence for soft being more comfortable because comfort's determined by flexibility at the interface between the mould and the ear. So in the majority of people that we see, the ear is flexible. Yeah? So if the ear's the flexible bit, then the ear mould can be hard and you, the two things will join together. Um, so if your ear is flexible, then the hard material will still be very comfortable. If you've got somebody, and you do get, particularly in older people, you'll get people who 
the ear doesn't move at all. It is really quite stiff and it's cartilage that's kind of started to break down. Then it may be that a softer material is better for them. But essentially, for most people, the ear is flexible, so the hard material is still comfortable. We don't tend to place standard ear moulds into the bony portion of the canal where there is little flexibility anyway. But if you are doing a deep mould, you might want a soft material down in that bony portion of the canal because it isn't flexible down there. Okay, allergic reactions we should swap to a soft mould. Absolute myth. Um, true contact dermatitis is really rare uh, from an ear mould. Mainly it's sweat reactions from having something filling up your ear canal and filling up your ear that's the problem, particularly in the concha bowl. So we would say generally that opening up the ear piece is a much better way to deal with a red ear. So if you look down somebody's ear canal, it's come in with a red ear, itchy ear. If it's a true contact dermatitis, it will be everywhere the ear mold touches. It'll be down the canal as well. Whereas if it's just a sweat reaction because they've got a blocked up ear, it will be in the concha bowl. It'll still be red and it'll be shiny and it'll be itchy, but it'll be in the concha bowl. Um, Arlington did a piece of research that wasn't published but was shared with us. It was around um, what reactions people have to ear moulds and they sent out the patch testing. Um, and they asked people who were saying, actually, we need an allergic ear mould, which would you recommend to patch test the patient with the different types of ear mould material? Nobody reacted to the ear mould material. It was a reaction to things like their shampoo, um, to their soap, to their face cleanser. And it was only showing up in the ear because it was hot. So as soon as you start looking at skeletons or taking it down to half shells or canal moulds, we got rid of those reactions. It wasn't a huge study, it was about 34 people, but it was enough to make a difference. Make the ear mould easier to clean. So a lot of ear moulds now are, are generally hyperallergenic anyway, but making it easier to clean, making it easier for people to wash that residue off at the end of the day or the week is a much better idea. And as I said to you, things like the hard materials can get thrown into some Milton or to be properly cleaned. And then the other thing would be to use a laser printed mould. Do you all know who your how your manufacturer manufactures your moulds? So how many of you are using somebody that laser prints? Quite a lot. So the benefit of laser printing for an allergy, allergy generally is when the molecules in the plastic haven't cured together enough because they weren't heated at a high enough temperature. So when you just boil them or you just UV light them quite quickly to make the plastic solid, you have free um, polymers still in the plastic and if somebody is sensitive when those three polymers leach out of the product into the ear they will start a reaction by laser light curing it's heated to a much higher temperature and it forces the polymers of the plastic to join together more it means that there are less of them roaming around free in the product and therefore less to leach out does that make sense that's C's chemistry lesson for the afternoon i promise so first reaction, if you find somebody with an allergy, is try them with a hard laser printed mould from whichever manufacturer you want to use. Oh, soft is soft. Sorry, that was... <laughs> myth, myth, myth. Soft is not just soft. Soft materials come in a range of different Shaw values. My glamorous assistant, to my right, will now hand out a number of things which will help you to understand the texture of ear moulds. So you will find opal fruits, which are our 40 Shaw. You'll find jelly babies, which are the 25 Shaw. And you'll find some very expensive toffee chocks from Thornton's, which are the 60 Shaw. The only way to truly experience ear mould texture is to eat them. <laughs> um, but as I say, the idea is that the three different textures are three distinct different textures. The texture affects the ease of insertion. You need to use the right show value for your patient. In general, when you're looking at a silicone mould, it becomes permanently elastic and it doesn't harden or discolour. But as I say, soft is not soft. Soft has a range of texture. 
So the 25 show, jelly babies, yeah? Jelly babies are very good for fragile ears. They do need thicker tubing, um, and the tubing can be easily dislodged when you pull it. Venting in a jelly baby. You try and put a hole in a jelly baby and then push it into a pen top. You're going to struggle. So venting on a 25 isn't going to stay open. Um, it is generally very difficult for people to adjust in-house, but it is very forgiving around bumps and lumps in ears, so if you've got any abnormalities in the ears. The 40 shore is easier to vent and to shape. It's similar to some of the old and more classic materials, and it, it's usually the default build for most soft moulds. So if you just say soft mould and you don't say what texture, then that's what you'll get. It's soft, but it's not squishy. So that's your opal fruit. Um, I know they're not called opal fruits anymore. My glamorous assistant said if I didn't call them opal fruits, he wasn't going to hand out my sweets. <laughs> um, and it takes different tubing thicknesses, so it doesn't have to have the very thickest of tubing. The 60 shore is quite hard. So that's your toffee chalk, which I'm hoping somebody's left a couple for me. Um, it's good for people with dexterity issues. And it's quite easy to adjust and to vent and to carve. So it's a good texture for making skeletons out of. It's generally the tubing's more easily retained. And the one that um, my company uses is similar to the soft acrylic mould. So if you were looking to swap from that nasty yellow soft acrylic, a 60 shore texture would be roughly about the same. So the toffee chalk would be about the same. Hard with a soft tip is not a good option for anybody, ever. Um, the cosmetics are better, don't get me wrong, I do know the cosmetics are better because you get that nice hard acrylic on the outside and it's permanently clear. Um, and the tubing retention's pretty good. It's not as easy to clean, is it? It does go yellow um, or even brown. Uh, it doesn't have any low allergy properties though because acrylic, soft acrylic is such an old material. It was great in its day, but it's not naturally it's not um, a low allergy material and it needs either coating or soaking for a long time. Unnecessary joining of two points leaves you with a weakness. So you will find people that come in with them broken, the two bits broken off from each other and it does discolour. And we would again recommend replacement every 12 months because it does shrink over 12 months. So hopefully I've busted a few myths. I do want to tell you about my favourite ear mold modification. I'm an audiologist and I'm a geek. Um, <laughs> it's something called a power vent. Um, and it's a long, thin vent that allows ventilation but doesn't give a feedback path. So normally when we talk about venting, we talk about width and length. And we say that the shorter and fatter the vent, the better the escape route for the sound, yeah? So if we were all trying to leave this room, we wanted, we'd want to go out the double doors and we'd be able to get through faster and we'd want to go straight outside if it was an emergency. So the shorter and fatter the escape route, the better. This particular thing on a hard printed mould only runs all the way around the conch bowl. So it actually ventilates out here. And what that does is it allows air into the ear to ventilate it, but it doesn't let sound escape. So it doesn't cause you any potential feedback problem. So you can see it on that, on that picture there, on that image, you can see it coming around the back of the helix area. And what that actually does is it lets you ventilate somebody's ear who's got hearing loss at 90 or beyond, whereas we would stop with a parallel vent because we would set up a feedback path and cause you problems even with the best feedback managers. This allows you for somebody who's got those runny ears and every time they put the ear mold back in, it starts them running again. It's certainly something to try. It is only possible with printing. So it's not something you can order from a hand molded lab because you couldn't drill that. You have to print it. Just a, a very quick word on style. What can they see? What can the customer feel? How close does the mould have to be to prevent feedback? Are there any abnormalities you need to account for? How easy is it to maintain? And how do they take the mould out? It's no good giving somebody a nice soft mould if they pull on the tubing to take it out because the tubing's just going to be in the hand the whole time. So you do need to consider how somebody's actually using the mould. 
Skeletons are a great choice. They're not sweaty. They're easy to hold for orientation, for insertion. Some people, they can be a little bit fragile, but it returns in most ears. And don't forget the semi-skeleton where you can take the back out. Cauliflower ears, something like that, you can take the back out using a semi-skeleton. Canals and half shells, I know some dispensers will use basically canal and half shell even for severe and profound losses. It's cosmetically really good. People don't have to manipulate under the helix. It can be useful with just a little canal lock on it if somebody has got retention issues. Remember, the impression needs to be good for a canal because you've got to retain that in the air somehow. So if we haven't got a nice second bend, we're not going to be able to build that very effectively. Shells. Shells are good. They've got great sealing properties. They block the whole ear. They're often really easy to get a grip off if somebody's got a dexterity issue, but they can cause those sweat reactions. Generally, shells are available in pretty much every material type. And just for a little entertainment. 